talking about the organization. It's going to be talking about the patient population that we deal with. Then we'll be talking about communication. Okay? Communication plays an important role in our success as technologists within a, a healthcare environment. And we'll also be talking about different types of work hazards that you might be dealing with as a technologist within that environment. Okay? So today, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to be talking about, again, uh, just a, a touch or scratching the surface about the organization. Uh, we'll talk about insurances next week. Today we'll talk about um, the different uh, patient populations from the pediatrics to the geri geriatrics. First, the objective in, in patient population. So the responsibilities of a healthcare facility. There has been a, a great trend in the last decade or so in that the shift went from caring for the sick, treating the ill, and trying, and now it's gone to preventive medicine, trying to get them before they get sick, before they get ill, before they come to the hospital. Sadly, what it has become is healthcare has become big business. <coughs> okay? It's in the business of taking care of people. But it's still a business. And the objective is the, of the business is to generate money. Okay? So what they have found is that if we can keep people healthy and not come to the hospital, <coughs> They don't utilize the resources. They don't use, utilize uh, staffing. Okay? They don't utilize your, your medications, your instruments, your equipment. Because if you come to the hospital when you're sick, okay, you start utilizing staff and resources. And the longer that you stay in the hospital, the more staff time and more hours and more resources that they use. So the more they use, the less income is generated. Does that make sense? So if they can minimize that, then they start making money. So again, the focus has been on preventing, uh, preventive care. Okay. So the responsibilities of a healthcare facility is to advocate health promotion and illness prevention. B is to reduce the overall healthcare cost by practicing preventive care and promoting healthy lifestyles. We care for all patients regardless of condition. That includes gender, includes race, religion, cultural background, economic background. We don't turn anybody away. Let's talk about the different classifications of uh, hospitals, how they're classified. They're generally classified by <coughs> titles known as trauma level. Trauma level is very simple in that it defines whether or not the facility has the resources and services that they need. Level three. Level three, I'm sorry, level one is going to be your major trauma unit. Major trauma unit. And all that means is that they're open 24 hours a day. Okay? They don't close. They're 24 hours a day and they generally have all the services that you need in sustaining life. They generally have all the services that you need in sustaining life. And it is 24 hours. That means there's somebody there on staff, regardless of what department, they are there 24 hours or they're readily available within a minute's notice. <clears throat> okay. So again, they care for all injuries. It is a large medical institution with specialized personnel and equipment and rapid intra-hospital transportation systems. What that means is every, this rapid intra-transportation, that means everything that you need is within the facility. We got two uh, level one trauma hospitals here in 
Orange County. One of them is UCI. The other one, it used to be called West Med Santa Ana, but I think they changed their name to, I think, Global Santa Ana. That must have been acquired by a uh, physician group. Okay, but those are your two major trauma centers. So whenever you see like major accidents, uh, fires, uh, major injuries, they always say the patient has been transported to UCI or they've been transported to West Med Santa Ana. Okay, so those are your two uh, level one trauma centers here in Southern California. And when we're talking about the radiology department, again, they run 24 hours, so there's always gonna be somebody there on staff. Diagnostic x-ray, CT, MRI, ultrasound, nuclear medicine, okay? Um, special procedures, the cardiac cath lab. They're, they're gonna be operating 24 hours a day, so they'll have somebody there on staff, or they'll have somebody readily available within a minute's notice. Now, if we talk about level two, level two is the rest of the hospitals here in our area. Level two, they have a majority of the services that you would find in level one, but not all of it. You will have most of it. And if they don't have it, okay, they'll transfer them into a level one unit when the patient is stable. So they'll stabilize the patient. If they don't have the services that they need, then they will be immediately transferred to one of those hospitals we're talking about, UCI or, okay or West Smith, Santa Ana, or they'll be transferred to uh, a, a major trauma unit in, in LA, or Riverside County, or San Diego County, wherever they're closer to, okay? Now, level two, they have a majority of the services, <clears throat> but they operate just like a normal business. They have normal staffing from, let's just say, eight to five, okay? After the eighth or tenth hour, people go home as normal. The hospital and the departments are run on a skeleton crew. That means minimal staffing. And then and if an emergency comes up, okay, you guys ever heard of a pager? You guys know what pagers are, right? Google it, <laughs> okay? Pagers. So if a service is needed after hours, they page the staff in. And again, they can respond within a minute's notice. You'll be doing that when you guys become technologists. Okay? That'll be part of your requirement for the specialized departments. After eight or 10 hours, everybody goes home, but there's gonna be maybe about two or three of you in whatever department that you work that will be carrying one of those pagers. Okay? And if it starts to beep, you gotta respond within 30 minutes. Okay, that's usually the uh, time that you need to respond is within 30 minutes, okay? All right, then level three is gonna be your rural areas. Not a lot of services, not adequately staffed, but they have enough just to sustain any life-threatening conditions and then they get immediately transferred to level two or level one. Okay, <coughs> any questions here? All right, so let's talk about the different uh, patient populations. We'll begin with pediatrics. Pediatrics is anywhere from zero days all the way till uh, you turn an adult, 17 or 18 years old, okay? From zero to 17 to 18. <coughs> First, before I present this, is that as clinicians, you need to be able to shift gears. You will be dealing with, with patients of different ages, different backgrounds. How you deal and communicate with one patient will not be exactly the same way you would deal with another. <coughs> and you're constantly shifting gears. Age specific is one of those. The way you would deal and communicate with a three-year-old would not be the same as dealing with a 17-year-old, right? or someone in their 40s, or someone in their 70s. <coughs> so if you have a broad understanding of the different age groups, <coughs> this broad understanding will make you a better technologist. 
first one here is neonates. <coughs> neonates are less than 28 days old. Less than 28 days old. Touch, <coughs> sight, sound is very important at this age. Okay? Because this is where they start developing their sensory, uh, sensory organs. Touch especially. It has been known that kids who are born given up for adoption immediately, and there isn't anybody there to hold them, caress them, feel the warm body, hear the beating heart of the mom or the dad, they have been known to die. So they encourage that once the baby is born, touch, feeling, sight, they don't see very well, but sight and sound is important in the development of this child. What's also important to, to know here is that when you're dealing with neonates, okay, 28 days, less than 28 days old, do they have an immunity yet? No. no. Not yet, so still trying, to, still trying to develop. With that said, they have no immunity, or little. So if you have to go to the department, neonatal department, neonatal intensive care unit. Have you guys ever heard of NICU or NICU? Yes? You will be going to this department on occasion to take chest x-rays, abdominal x-rays, maybe an ultrasound of their heart or their abdomen. Because they have no or little immunity, <coughs> what are you going to practice? We talked about this second and third week. What is it? Asepsis. Good aseptic technique. Okay? You gotta wipe down your equipment before you go into the room. Wash your hands, wear gloves, wear a mask. You may have to wear a gown. Okay? Because again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to protect them from us. Okay? Next one here are infants. Infants are <coughs> 28 days to one year. <coughs> Kids this age, ultrasound not such a big deal, but when you're doing x-rays, with x-rays, what are we utilizing to produce our images? What are we using? Radiation. Radiation. What do we know about radiation? Is it healthy? No. no. Okay. It's detrimental to the person's health, especially at a cellular level. Well, so what that means is that we need to try to get an image on the first go around. No repeats, because every time you repeat an x-ray, you are doubling the patient's exposure. Okay? And especially when they're this young, again, at a cellular level, they're very, very sensitive to radiation. Very sensitive to radiation. Okay? So we want to get it done right the first time. At this age, you can't, they can't keep still. They like to wiggle. They, they, like, they like to move. Okay? You can't tell them to hold still. Okay? So we have different types of immobilization devices. I have some pictures on the next slide. There's a pigostat. We got papoose boards. We got tandem boards. We got tape. We got Velcro. We have blankets and towels that we can wrap them up like a burrito or sushi, whatever you want to say. Okay, but we wrap them up so they can't move. All right? So, same thing as this. You know, you've got to be, you've got to build good rapport, not only with family, not only with the children, but also the families, because the family members are going to be there watching you take these x-rays. That's very nerve-wracking, right? Because when somebody's watching you, you're most likely going to make a mistake. Or when they're watching you, you're wanting to rush because you got this kid crying and you got the parents looking at you like, okay, what are you doing? Right? Again, with the objective of trying to get this done right the first time. All right, so we got pigastats, papoose boards, never leave the child untended, holding comfort by talking to them before the procedures, and you may also have the parents assist you during the procedure. I usually don't like having the parents in the room. Okay, I say, get out, I'll take care of this. Okay? But if you need their help, they're there. Use them. So the whole thing again is trying to prevent them from moving around. <laughs> this is a real child, by the way. I added this. You got this one. I found this one. 
Yeah, it's a chubby baby. <laughs> Look at those rolls. But you can see that this picostat can accommodate um, different size kits. They, they are put and strapped around a uh, plexiglass encasement. Okay, so they can't move, they can't wiggle. And again, it's, it's amazing to me how these kids aren't even crying. Okay? Yeah, but they sit, down, they sit down on a bicycle seat and it swivels in different directions so you can get different projections of the image, front to back, side to side. Okay, so we can move this swivel around. Then we also got the papoose board, which is, you know, Velcro strapping on a radiolucent plastic board. By the way, guys, Let's just say x-rays and ultrasound doesn't work for you. Go into medical devices. Make them, produce them, sell them. What do you guys see here? Isn't this just Velcro and cloth and nylon that you can buy over there like at Michael's or Arts and Craft? Okay, in a plastic board. They sell this stuff for anywhere between $600 to $1,000. Okay. I had a friend of mine who developed a shield, which is basically just a shield that had attenuating properties to minimize the amount of x-rays in the room that you're standing. Just bought it, cut it out, put some metal attachments on it and screws, and you sold it for $7,000 a piece. Remember I told you guys about the disinfectants? Mm -hmm. All it is is just Clorox or Fantastic or whatever you want to call it. But because it says for medical use, they charge it 500% over, over the regular price. All right, take a stat. <coughs> I've been in the industry for over 25 years, and I never questioned once what pig stat means. Mm -hmm. Do they look like pigs? <laughs> no. They don't look like pigs, right? These are kids. But I, I never questioned the name, so I, I, I took it upon myself to Google what this meant yesterday. So Pig, Ostat, was named after a doctor who invented this, Dr. Pig. Dr. Pig. His name was Dr. Pig. That's why there's two G's on here. <laughs> Dr. P-I-G-G. So he's the one that invented this, making lots of money, and fantastic. But there are different types of immobilization devices because we want to keep the child still, okay? That's the point I'm trying to get across is <clears throat> kids are very radio sensitive to, to radiation, so we do our very best to minimize repeats by immobilizing them during an x-ray procedure. <clears throat> okay, toddlers, one to three. One to three. Toddlers want to control situations. How many of you guys have kids? Okay, how many guys want kids? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Ages one to three, okay? This is where parents start to lose control. These are where the kids start taking control and training the parents, okay? And they do it by way of throwing tantrums, throwing different types of negative behaviors at the parents, okay? So around the parents, they're just monsters, but around strangers, complete opposite. You guys agree? They're the complete opposite, right? They're angels around other people. When my kids were growing up, they were saying, yeah, yeah, Dean, he's such an angel. I went, my Dean? You can't be talking about the same kid, all right? But they throw temper tantrums and exhibit negative behavior. Um, as a technologist, it's gonna take you a little bit longer to perform this procedure because the procedure itself is gonna take maybe about two or three minutes. A majority of the time will be trying to build good rapport with that child, okay? You just don't throw them in an x-ray room and start taking pictures because what you're trying to do here is you're trying to gain their trust and try to gain their rapport. So you want to ease them into the room, show them around, have them touch the equipment. They can do that. Nothing's going to happen, okay? They can touch the equipment. Show them tongue depressors, uh, the, uh, what do you call that? The tourniquet. Show them some gloves. Blow, blow air into the gloves. Make a nice uh, balloon puppet, 
okay? Do something, but you're building good rapport. So when you actually do the procedure, now you've got their attention. Now, when you have good rapport, they will follow directions, okay? But again, they may or may not hold still for you. And this is why rapport and communication is very important, okay? Show the x-ray equipment and explain procedure in terms they can understand. You may have to use different types of restraining devices as well, but you want to talk them through the procedure, and again, never ever leave them alone. Okay, preschoolers, three to six years old. <coughs> again, parents will understand this. Three to six years old. At this age, they are less afraid. They are very inquisitive. They like to ask a lot of questions. And one thing that scares me is that they're not afraid of strangers. They'll just go up to anybody and start having a little conversation. I've had kids coming up to me, showing me their dollies, mm -hmm. showing me their coloring books, what they've done, pieces that they've drawn, okay? Now they're coming up to me and showing me what they're playing on the iPad, okay, <laughs> or smartphones, okay? But these are just kids, I don't know, they just come up to you, they sit by you and they start saying, hey, look what I'm doing, <clears throat> okay? So they are less afraid of strangers, so they may ask multiple questions. <coughs> as technologists, you want to answer them as truthfully as possible. Truthfully as possible. <coughs> they have a tough time distinguishing reality from, from fantasy. Okay? But again, the key here is building good rapport, answering the questions as truthful as possible, trying to keep the instructions as simple as possible, okay? So in other words, you want to dumb down your language, okay? Don't use big words. Use words that they can understand. And you also want to talk at their level. You don't want to talk above them because that's very intimidating. You talk at their level, eye to eye level. So if that requires you to kneel or sit, this is how you're gonna gain trust is by talking to them eye to eye, okay? They may easily get frightened. Explain why you have to restrain them. Not because you're bad, you're crying. I have to tie you down. Just let them know, okay, this is, I'm just gonna put this around you so you don't move during the picture, okay? I want you to hold still. This is just gonna help you communicate with them. All right, any questions here? School age children between six to 12. <clears throat> six to 12. This is the age where you're going to see a lot of <coughs> these kids between six to 12 showing up in the ER. Okay. This is also around the time when they start what time, what year did they start preschool? Around this age, right? Three, four, usually around six. What are they showing up in the emergency room for? Curious about the stuff probably. Okay, a lot of infections, right? They're constantly getting sick. So they're, they're, at this point, they're starting to build their immunity because they're around other children. Okay, so they're gonna be showing up in the ER with colds, flus, fevers, different types of infections, okay? This is also the age where the parent starts um, signing them up for different activities. Gymnastics, soccer, baseball, football, okay? Dance. Can kids get hurt doing those things? Mm -hmm. All the time. So they're showing up in the, in the emergency room with different types of sports injuries, okay? It's also at this, at this age where they're fearless. They like to climb things, right? I remember as a kid, I used to jump up on the roof, climb up to the roof, and I saw too many shows or cartoons where, where the character would fly or jump off something with an umbrella, and they would float. And I remember doing that as a kid. I'd jump off the roof with an umbrella, and it's like, dang it, it didn't work. And I'd go back in the roof and do it again. <laughs> I used to live, my room was on the second floor, so I had an, uh, an open balcony to the living room, okay? I used to get the sofa cushions and just lay them there, and I used to jump off the window of my balcony and into the living room where the cushions were. 
I had never broke anything, but I was, I was lucky. So they like to climb things, they like to jump on things, they like to jump over things. So you get a lot of kids showing up with broken bones, right? All right, so all this is just saying here, <coughs> developmental stage, bone and primary teeth start to develop, often in the ER, so they may develop a fear of illness, injury, and death. They're also inquisitive here. It's gonna be a little bit different from the, the toddlers and the preschoolers because now, instead of telling them what to do, you're gonna ask them to do it for you. So if you need them to, if you need to position the body in a certain way to get the right x-ray, instead of manipulating the body, you tell them to, hey, can you put your palm up? Can you put your palm down? Can you turn your elbow for me? Do you mind turning your body? Ask for their help. They're gonna want to do it, okay? Be open and honest and explain procedures in a language they understand. Again, you wanna talk at their level. Don't, be, don't dumb it down too much and don't talk like an adult, okay? Talk at their level. Now you have your adolescents, 13 to 18 years old. This is from puberty to adult. Kids start getting their driver's license. So prior to them getting their driver's license and their learner's permit, they drive very slowly and they drive very safely. But once they get their license, they're held on wheels, right? <clears throat> so that's what happens. There's a lot of uh, motor vehicular accidents once they get their license. They start, uh, peer pressure starts to be a big thing. A big thing. Okay, so they're in, easily influenced by the world around them and the people around them. They start experimenting with drugs. They start uh, experimenting with different types of sexual activities. Okay, so another thing is also is peer pressure. They're very impressionable. They are self-conscious about the way they look. They're self-conscious about fitting in into a particular group. And if they don't fit in, Okay, again, this is where drug abuse and other things come, comes into play, but also depression because there is that lack of acceptance. Okay, so these are some of the things that you may see in an emergency room. Okay, now it says adolescents are between 13 to 18 years old, but I know many guys in their 30s who fall under this category. <laughs> All right, any questions? Okay, let's make a shift to geriatrics. Geriatrics, also understanding their, their situation, okay? It's not just physiologic changes, okay? Yes, it's, obviously, it's obvious that they're getting old, okay? But it's not just the physical part of it, there's emotional changes as well, okay? Let's talk about the physical part of it. The, get older, things don't work the way they used to. Okay, so they're showing up in the ER with respiratory problems, heart and vascular problems. We get a lot of patients coming in again with heart disease, those with broken bones. Their bones are very brittle. So just a slight trip and fall, they can either break their wrist, their shoulder, their hips, their femur. Those are the common breaks in geriatric patients. Skin is very sensitive, so they can be easily torn. Do you think this is good to know when you're x-raying an elderly patient? <coughs> okay. They're sensitive to the environment around them. In other words, any types of change in temperature. They, become, they can become very cold. It can be 90 degrees outside, but to them it feels like it's <coughs> 70 below. I say 70 low, below because even 70, it's freezing to them. Okay. So they're sensitive to the environment, sensitive to skin tears. Their eyesight may be bad, okay? Their hearing may be bad. Hearing goes, so when you are communicating with a geriatric patient, don't talk off to their sides, talk in front of them. They may be lip readers. You may have to raise your voice a little bit. You may have to speak to one of their better ear. <coughs> okay? So these are just some of the things that I'm talking about here, okay? The other thing too on the other chart here is that um, emotionally, they may be going through some changes in their lives. 
You get an elderly patient and they're cranky. Well, they're, they're cranky. They're not cranky because they're old. They're cranky because there might be something going on in their lives that we don't understand. So you have to be empathetic. You gotta be empathetic and be, be prepared to deal with cranky patients, okay? Because maybe just because they could have lost their spouse. Could have been that they were forced into retirement. It could be that their social security isn't providing for them what they need to survive. Are you guys following? It could be that their kids are no longer keeping in touch with them. Do you know that the number of geriatric patients start to rise around Thanksgiving? That's when it starts to rise. Thanksgiving <laughs> all the way through Christmas up until New Year's. It's not because they're sick. It's because they're lonely. Yeah. They come to the hospitals because they're lonely. So they need somebody to keep them company. So that's, that's when you see a rise in, in the patients coming in. Think about that. Okay. Be sensitive, be empathetic. But these, these are all the things that they're going through. But yes, you do have angry, nasty, you know, old patients. Sometimes you get them and you just let it ride, okay? But it's not that just that age group, I'm talking about any age group. You get just got people who are just angry all the time, okay? By the way, you know how, who have the worst mouths? Who have the nastiest languages? <coughs> old people. Who do you think came up with those bad words? <laughs> They're the ones who came up with it. Yeah, just imagine, you know, imagine somebody who was in their 80s seeing the F word. F this, F that, F me alone. <laughs> okay, promoting, okay, so we went back to promoting health and preventing illnesses, okay. So, again, the main course here is to try to prevent um, them from getting sick, coming to the hospitals, or if they come to the hospital, we want to keep them as short as short a stay as possible this is just a rep, uh, repetition of what we said before so there's different types of programs out there that prevents illnesses uh, educational <coughs> uh, educational fairs um, community outreach things that you see on TV things that are provided by mailers and pamphlets okay. so these are some of the things that are provided education well, patients about the exam being done on them requires effective communication skills and presenting info clearly and concisely. So you know, you understand the broad patient population, <coughs> but effective communication is two ways. You begin it and you also end it. Okay, we need effective communication. As technologists, you're just not there pushing the button. You're not there just moving the transducer probe. 